Hello, everyone. I'm Ismani Michelle, and I'm NIWIF Special Projects Associate. Welcome to NIWIF Women Who Dares documentary series, which is part of our 2020 Creative Workforce Summit, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. The goal of this series is to show the work of women directors um, that seek to awaken a collective consciousness through their contributions to our culture, history, and the world. This screening series was created in partnership with the International Documentary Association, IDA, and with the support of the National Endowment for the Arts. This is our second week of six week screening series. And I hope you had a chance uh, to watch RBG directed by Julie Cohen and Betsy West over the weekend. I'm happy to introduce this conversation between the editor of the film, Carla Guterres and Marsha Rock, the, doc the director of news and documentary at NYU Journalism. Uh, Marsha's latest documentaries are Unwind, that is a festival in, and that's in festivals right now, and Service When Women Come Marching, Marching Home, that aired on PBS station around the country. She's also co-author of, um, co-author with Marlene Sanders of Waiting for Primetime, The Women of Television News. Thank you. Thank you, Ismani, very much. Um, I'm very excited to host this today and uh, love talking about editing. It's to me one of the most creative aspects of filmmaking. And I know that Carla is going to share some wonderful insights and maybe a few secrets. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Carla to you. She's an Oscar nominated editor for the documentary La Corona and the Emmy nominated report Taro and Kingdom of Shadows. She also edited When Two Worlds Collide, winner of a special jury award at Sundance. Her latest film, Shavella won the second place audience award at the 2017 Berlinale Film Festival. Her work's been on HBO, Netflix, POV, Independent Lens, and the Sundance Channel. And you might have met her in person uh, at uh, the Sundance Edit Lab or Firelight Producers Lab, where she's a creative advisor. So why we're here today is that Carla edited the Oscar nominated documentary, RBG. And I hope you all had a chance to see it. And if not, uh, Carla chose a few clips to discuss, um, to help you get deeper into the content. Uh, so welcome, Carla. Hi, so great <laughs> to be here. <laughs> we do not share secrets editors now <laughs> <laughs> so so carla before we get deep into rbg tell us a little bit about how you got involved in editing in the first place how did it find you or did you find it um i think we found each other i um I went to film school, um, you know, people take different paths into filmmaking and my path was education. Um, and I went to, I knew that I was really interested in documentary only. So I didn't go to a uh, film school that had fiction um, as, and I went to the Stanford documentary program. Um, and while there, um, I just happened to really enjoy the process of the edit. Uh, Documentary or narrative? <laughs> but in the every room I like seem to thrive. Um, I was uh, never had a hard time like cutting the babies. Um, and and I, I believe that some of my projects in film school were the shorter ones in, in the class. Um, so it, it was just um, 
you know, in the edit room, I just found that that problem solving was really exciting to me, um, and and finding solutions and playing with structure uh, was so much fun. And it was a mental challenge that I just really enjoyed and and thrived in. So that so I think we found each other. That's how I got into editing. And was it documentary or narrative editing that you started? It was all it was all documentary. So the film program at Stanford is only documentary. It's very small. Um, only eight people per class, two classes. Um, after Stanford, I uh, was very lucky because I started as a translator and then an, as an assistant editor for a documentary that was being edited by a very experienced editor. And I learned, and she became my mentor, um, Kim Roberts, and I learned a lot from her. And I really learned how to look at long form structure and storytelling, narrative arcs. So that was, you know, I always call her my post doctorate <laughs> degree. That's what I got with her. Okay, so we're going to dive deep into all of those things, problem solving, structure and narrative arc. Um, but first, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you worked with your director and how you got the process started? What did they come to you with and what did you come to them with? Mm -hmm. Is that for specifically RBG or in general? Okay, mm -hmm. specific. So, you know, working with Julie and Betsy is just fantastic because they have a strong vision of what they want the film to say. Um, so, you know, the, their big picture guidance is like really focused, which is great because you can see as I'm delving into the interviews and delving into the material that they have captured, um, they went into shooting with an aim. And you can tell that from the footage that they get. Um, and how they focus the interviews. So that's already an incredibly incredible asset. So they're not, you know, they're not, there's a lot of times, which is wonderful. And, you know, like people shoot, they do a lot of research shooting, but they're kind of shooting their film to find their story, right? Um, it's just like a kind of like a different type of process. Um, and, um, but with them, and I, I actually was just working with them in, in another film that they're producing, um, it's, they, you know, gave me room to also have a relationship with the footage and discover gems from the archival and like little moments even in the interviews, um, you know, just kind of like have uh, some time to be able to look at things with my fresh eyes and discover the gems, like the potential, like really emotional moments. Um, and, and so then, you know, we come together and with their guidance, the big picture focus, and with my understanding of what we can do with the material or how can we make that like vision really come alive and really sing, um, you know, like that's, that's how the writing of the film um, the putting together of the story comes together. And yeah, it's just, I, you know, they become mentors to me and, and we just found a really great flow of working together. It's just really, you know, it's great when you, the collaboration is like fun and, you know, productive. Uh, so yeah. Did they come to you with their favorite um, quotes? Did they come to you with their favorite scenes? Or did you all sort of talk about how to get started? Um, it's a kind of fluid process. A lot of times um, with them, I do passes at segments, like understanding what you know the different parts of the story are. But I, I might do passes at segments kind of like on my own. And then they, they give me a lot of feedback. Um, they you know like to work with with you know transcripts of the of the actual rough cuts that we're putting together um sometimes you know sometimes um as i'm working in other segments they'll take a stab on paper film or so so it's like a very fluid process and it's worked really really well um and you know, so so some of the segments is just like talking about the idea of what we're trying to convey, and then I go and just kind of put it together from from the rough material. Um, so 
Yeah, uh, but we do talk about structure um, with RBD, for example, you know, there was, um, you know, especially the historical stuff kind of like took a linear structure. And then we have these like segments of spending time with RBD in present time. And, you know, later on in the process, there was a lot of uh, watching the cat. Some of the segments were really, really rough. And then like moving the pieces around to see what, you know, what worked. And we would watch, you know, those cuts together and just move in the, you know, we had index cards on the wall. Um, and, you know, all of us kind of bringing ideas of how to tackle things. Um, what I really love about them is that, you know, I was kind of surprised the first time I worked with them in RBG because traditionally, um, usually, uh, sometimes you have to convince the directors to to cut things out, to like let things go, because it, it is going to be like trimming and making it tighter is going to make the story stronger. But there's like sometimes you just have to let go of like really wonderful stuff or scenes or even a character. <laughs> Uh, but with them, I was very surprised because they were like, no, let's cut this out and let's cut this this out too. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And like, <laughs> can we just try it? Like, let's just keep it there for the next pass. I mean, most of the stuff that they really wanted to cut out early, like was not, you know, they were not in the in the final film. But I was just so surprised because I've never had directors like pushing me to let go <laughs> before I push them to let go of stuff. So that was a really fun surprise through the process of RBG. Uh, by the way, everyone, um, if you have a question, will you type it in the comment section and we'll get to it at the end of our conversation. Um, so did you have, start with a conversation with your directors about your themes? When I was watching it, I came up with these. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of curious to know how you worked through them. Sort of her early life, her love, her education, um, her story as a lawyer, the opera, her time as a judge and the cases, and then her notorious moment. Were those sort of the, the building blocks that you had and did you sort of work them out separately and then start to intercut? Um, I think that we had some bigger picture themes. So we knew that the, you know, the spine of the film was kind of like her, her, you know, um, building this warrior persona that she had as a lawyer, um, fighting for women's rights. So, so the first two acts of the film it ended up being the two acts, but we were thinking about like the first half of the film would be her, you know, pushing for those rights to happen in the legal world, right? And then, and then when you think about her personal experience and how that personal experience kind of influenced the way that she, she saw the world and the way that she saw the world treating women, then they together. So, so even you know, even when you meet her husband, like the you know the story of where they meet. A theme in that segment is, you know, he was different than all most men at the time because he was interested in a woman that would speak her mind and would do, you know, would, you know, not be shy and like try to pretend that she wasn't as smart as she was. So, and you know, same with with um, her experience going to Harvard Law School, being one of only like um, nine or eleven women. Um, so. So it was, you know, it was the buildup of like, you know, she, in her personal life, she was confronted with sexism. She was confronted with the limitations that a lot of women face at the time, right? And then she found this this voice as a lawyer to face that those limitations and to and to fight for women's rights. So that's kind of how we thought about it. Uh -huh. um, and then and then there's a shift where she becomes the justice and. And and then that it kind of like our narrative to figure out how we can put all the pieces together so you would get a sense of her voice, you know, moving from kind of like a moderate justice, justice, which is where she began, to the dissenting voice as we know her. And obviously the notorious segment is part of that, right, like right. you know, 
like coming into that voice. Um, so you know, so if you if you look at it, it's kind of like this big, these two narrative arcs that we were we were working with, and then the different pieces kind of came to, came to like be able to build those those big big picture ideas. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so, but if we get down to sort of the concrete aspect of editing. Mm -hmm. um, how did you organize the material in terms of bins and sequences and, you know, to, to take all that material and start to digest it? What's your own personal approach to um, doing that? So when I, um, and I've been doing a few of these lately, uh, when I'm working on heavy archival um, um, films, I do like to organize material chronologically. Like it just gives me like a very basic linear way of being able to jump around the footage or the pictures. Um, and um, so, you know, I mean, we kind of go like that. Um, once we have a chronological organization, then we can divide things maybe in themes or by events. Um, depending on what kind of archival it is. If it's archival of her main character, then all of that is together. And then, you know, obviously RBG at Harvard or, you know, RBG, like when she was a young lawyer, that, you know, that can be in one bin. Um, I think that with her, we just organized it by decade, you know, but obviously like, like one decade kind of fell into Harvard and other pictures around it. Um, and then you have, you know, what I call like historical texture that I love to play with a lot, which is, you know, New York in the 1940s um, when she, you know, when she was like growing up as a little girl or, you know, footage of the Supreme Court in the in the 50s when she, um, no, Frontiers in the 70s, like when she argued her first, um, her first case to the Supreme Court. So, so there is, you know, that's separate, but it's also organized chronologically. Um, so yeah, I, I have I have a very linear kind of you know um, um, just I follow that mentally really well, um, and then for some reason I mean even with hours and hours of material, uh, to, to towards the end of the project I become so familiar with stuff that I can find it really quickly, and then you know my associate editor and assistant editors they can they can do the same too. Like they'll like I'll you know I'll ask somebody. It's like, do you remember this one picture that had this little thing? And she's like, yes, and we go straight to it. Great, um, great. Yeah. So that leads us to your first clip, I think. So do you okay. want to, <laughs> um, do you want to set it up? Sure. So um, the first clip is actually when RBG meets her husband and they fall in love. And the reason why I wanted to show this was because. Um, it was the first thing I edited in the film. Um, and it was a scene that had a lot of heart that we knew that the relationship was gonna be central to her story. Um, but it was also kind of like a way for us to be able to see how we're gonna, how we were gonna put this film together. Because this film is one of those like, you know, 2000 pieces puzzles where you're like, um, just grabbing like little pieces, like maybe one soundbite or like the beginning of one soundbite from one interview, the end of one soundbite from another interview and uh, a presentation with her where she talks about the anecdote of meeting her husband, you know, pictures from different places. So, so it was a chance for us to be able to put a segment together that would make sense, that the narrative would be complete of that moment in time um, but, but where we were using a lot of the pieces that we were going to have to use throughout the film. Um, so yeah, that's the first clip. Okay. I have had the great good fortune to share life with a partner, truly extraordinary for his generation, a man who believed at age 18 when we met that a woman's work, whether at home or on the job is as important as a man's. I became a lawyer in days when women were not wanted by most members of the legal profession. I became a lawyer because Marty 
supported that choice unreservedly. So what was it about Marty? <laughs> Marty and I met when I was 17, he was 18. I was in college. Cornell was a preferred school for, for daughters. In those days, there was a strict quota for women. There were four men to every woman. So for parents, Cornell was the ideal place to send a girl. <laughs> if she couldn't find her man there, she was hopeless. <laughs> My first semester at Cornell, I never did a repeat date. <laughs> but then I met Marty, and there was something amazingly wonderful about this man. He was the first boy I ever knew who cared that I had a brain. Most guys in the 50s didn't. One of the sadnesses about the brilliant girls who attended Cornell is that they kind of suppressed how smart they were. But Marty was so confident of his own ability, so comfortable with himself, that he never regarded me as any kind of a threat. We all were struck by the tremendous difference between Marty and Ruth. Marty was the most gregarious, outgoing life of the party. Ruth was a really quite recessive in a way. Shy, quiet, soft voice. But they worked. They worked. Oh, he's so young. So, Carla, tell us about um, that archival footage and um, how your team found it and what it meant to your editing. Oh, well, that was an exciting day when we got it. <laughs> um, the we got a dvd from um the biographers who um, rbg put the, the directors in contact with and the biographers had gotten a dvd from um somebody in marty's family um so it was like uh, it was about an hour or an hour and a half of uh, eight millimeter you know personal material not a lot of people had cameras at the time but his his family somebody his family was taking uh you know the uh, filming staff, uh, personal staff. And most of it was just of the family. Ruth wasn't in it. Um, but there were these moments towards the end of the hour where you could see her and there was some footage from their honeymoon. And, you know, we like really took advantage of every frame of that footage. And and it was, it had not been seen in public before. So, so that was like very much our special archival. Um, yeah, so that was really fun. But if you, you know, I mean, I, I, I kind of set it up, but you, if you can hear the changes of the quality in the audio, you can see that like we built that whole, you know, story from many different interviews throughout the decades with her. And, and you know, lucky for us, uh, which was a surprise for me too, she never like changed her intonation of her voice and she has like a very steady way of talking um very different from other people that you know when they talk like sometimes they get very excited about something and they sound very you know their speech is very fast and sometimes they're you know they sound like kind of low energy but with her it was always kind of steady so we were able to mix a lot of different interviews together it was nice how you hung on oh, the left but didn't go for her response, right? When Nina Totenberg asks her that question, the whole audience laughs, and then you you take the laugh, but then you go forward for 
that was a nice moment. Yeah, and we, you know, that was that was kind of like um, we kept coming back to this. Um, Julie and Betsy had followed her for about a year. They had um, uh, filmed uh, a lot of uh, presentations, like events that she would go to, where she would ask be asked mainly legal stuff. Um, so. So we set that up from the very beginning, from the opening, we set up that like she's going to different places and people are listening to her. She's talking to, to law students, she's talking at a college. Um, so, so we could like always jump back in to those moments without confusing or, you know, um, or losing the thread of the story, but also without confusing the audience. So, so we were very conscious of setting that up from the beginning. Were you afraid of giving anything away in that beginning because it was such a montage of different places and things? Um, giving uh, giving up. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know where you, where you were going. Where you were going? At, um, no, I mean we use we use that. You know, I mean throughout the film we're really kind of like piecing it together. But um, I think I think just the fact that we had this really um, what felt like really intimate moments with her um, that we will come back to where you saw her, you know, in present time. Um, you know, it, it allowed for it kind of like pausing for a second and like taking it all in and, and maybe reflect on some of the things that we were, you know, we had touched on. Um, so, yeah. Got it, got it. Um, before we go to the next clip, I have one more question um, about your process. Mm -hmm. So since she talked about, say, Marty in many different uh, moments, different conversations with the directors, did you have a bin with that was topic related and, you know, Marty here? All, every time she talked about Marty, it was in one place so you could find it. So um, she didn't really talk about Marty much in in the actual interview with the directors. So we took from, you know, like what you see in the film, her going to law schools and, and um, you know, answering questions in front of an audience. Um, she's been doing that for decades. And that's pretty much like, you know, the bulk of the interviews with her are from those type of events. So, but no, it, it, that's just like, you know, it, those events were pretty long. And if you start like, for me at least, if you start like cutting a lot of little clips, um, it can get like really big and really messy in the browser in, you know, in, in my um, premiere, you know, setup. Um, but we had um, all those transcribed, all those events transcribed. Mm -hmm. So we could just do searches for, you know, when she was talking about Marty. So let's move on to the next clip. Would you like to set it up? Sure. Um, next clip. Okay. So this is her first case that she takes to the Supreme Court that, where she argues. And um, I wanted to show it because you will see there, you know, um, it really shows how we handle the challenge of making a film about the law, <laughs> which not, it's not, you know, very exciting sometimes. Yes. Uh, so that's all I'm going to say. And then I can talk about, you know, the things we did to make it exciting. Hopefully it is exciting. <laughs> Ruth and I set to work to write the brief. I would write a section and Ruth would take it and it would come back in a wonderfully brilliant fashion. Every word was carefully, I mean, Ruth went over every single word. What we wanted was a review of cases that the court would say, sex discrimination doesn't work. And it would be a broad command basically to legislatures to get rid of statutes that discriminate on the basis of of gender but she also added to make the point much more poignant the history of women and the way we were treated throughout america and its beginnings She captured for the male members of the court what it was like to be a second-class citizen.
Frontiero went to the court, Ruth Ginsburg, for the first time, made an oral argument. She split her time with the lawyer, the man who had begun the case in Alabama. It was an afternoon argument. So I was first up in the afternoon, and I didn't dare have lunch that day. She seemed nervous. Her eyes were wide with sort of anticipation. It's very intense and austere and important and very male, and it's the whole thing feels like. I was, I was really kind of scared. We sat down at the council table and had all these huge case books for me to help her with sites. And the court began with the oye, oye, and the, here, here we are. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. Mrs. Ginsburg. I was terribly, terribly nervous, but then I looked up at the justices, and I thought, I have a captive audience. I knew that I was speaking to men who didn't think there was any such thing as gender-based discrimination. And my job was to tell them it really exists. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Women today face discrimination in employment as pervasive and more subtle than discrimination encountered by minority groups. Sex classifications imply a judgment of inferiority. The sex criterion stigmatizes when it is used to protect women from competing for higher paying jobs promotions. It assumes that all women are preoccupied with home and children. These distinctions have a common effect. They help keep woman in her place, a place inferior to that occupied by men in our society. Great. So the law. <laughs> So, um, you know, it was interesting. The first time I started reading her arguments, I was completely lost. Um, you know, there was a lot of just legal language in between these really um, wonderful moments of intimacy in a way, because I, I feel that lawyers are very much storytellers. They just have a very different audience, um, but they, you know, they, in their process, they choose the right story to tell, to convince the audience, you know, um, to go with their argument um, for either you know changing or or you know staying with the law as it is, so um, so you know she picked great characters. So we had like already great characters that you know that were the cases that were taken to the Supreme Court, um, but it was it was just a question of like you know like really choosing the the right moments from her legal arguments that could be um, simple to the point. Um, and that took a lot of work, you know? I mean, it, it feels like it flows, but but to get, you know, to get to that, that you know, place where it feels like you're explaining something, but it's not too long or too confusing, uh, it just takes a lot of passes and we did that. Now, Julie and Betsy always had the idea from the very beginning that we would just use text. Um, and I think that was genius because with really hot audio that is very dense. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, not sometimes, but it's always good not to distract people um, with the visuals because they're taking a lot in. So the text that you see at the end over, you know, the visuals of the Supreme Court, um, you're kind of like reading what she's saying. So you're really, really, really paying attention to what she's saying. And that I think was very helpful for us, um, you know, to be able to be, be clear and you know, concise and clear to the audience. Um, the earlier uh, part of the clip shows a moment where we're introducing kind of like the big argument that she was making. She was taking this little law 
uh, and making like a huge argument against like overall, you know, sex discrimination for all cases, right? Um, and when I um, finally kind of like understood her language when I was reading her brief, um, I was really kind of taken by it and like got really emotional, like, oh my God, like she's taking the injustices and, you know, and oppression that women have felt from the very beginning of, of you know, our nation to this moment and that's, you know, she's telling their stories. And I felt like, how, you know, I was thinking like, how do we show that? How do we connect this brief and what she's doing to the whole history of, you know, women in the United States? And so I tried and, you know, Julian Betsy say like, go, go with something. And I tried just using pictures of women throughout the ages. Um, and there, you know, there's something like very, powerful at just looking, you know, like the eyes of, of people, like looking directly at the audience, plus, you know, putting that against her words and, and how she was like bringing those those faces and those eyes, you know, in front of the, this all, all male court. Um, so that was, you know, I remember when I saw the, the first pass of that, like, I think it, it like really did something emotional for all of us, for the team, and we just went for it, and you know, made it better throughout the edit. But, um, but yeah, so that was that's the segment. And I don't know if you noticed, but you know, the way that we, for example, um, play with the archival, you know, when she is kind of like walking up to the Supreme Court, you know, we were very careful in choosing the angles. So we really kind of wanted people to get this this sense of like, you know, a very small woman like looking up, so like all the tilt ups to the columns and just like, you know, all the shots from like above. And even when you see the picture of the Supreme Court is is of the, you know, the members of the Supreme Court, the justices, is 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 a shot from kind of like low. So they're looking down at you. So we, you know, we just kind of wanted wanted the audience to get a sense of like how she felt physically. So so we were going for that. So hopefully, you know. Even if people don't think, don't make that connection, like hopefully they feel something like that. So the walking up the steps is something that the director shot for this and you made it look like old footage? No, it was all archival. So I, so that was kind of like my take on the scene. And yeah, and, you know, yeah. and then the conversation is just like, okay, like we got the feeling, we can push it even more. You know, I remember Betsy really loving to see and, and that's something that's, that became our, our motif that um, throughout the whole film, that like she really loved to see all the pictures of men that were always in these like official, you know, official buildings. And you see that, I mean, the opening has like statues of men, you know, right. you see when she, yeah, when she's, um, when mm -hmm. she's um, seated as a justice, you see a picture of her surrounded by statues with, with Sandra Day O'Connor. So it was it was something that we were doing consciously and like it's like oh that's cool let's push it even more let's let's bring it here and over there yeah nice 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 um, what is your your approach to animating photographs do you like to keep them moving or do you like them still I noticed you used all of all of that yeah um, I'm a big proponent that that form should follow content. So it really depends on what is it that, what's your intent in the scene and what's your intent in the segment and what's your intent in the entire act. So, you know, so it's, it really kind of like your decisions of rhythm, your decisions on music or how you're playing with the pictures, um, you know, have to be directly connected to what you're trying to say and the mood that you're trying to, to set up. So, you know, sometimes, you know, cutting and zooming in and out of pictures really quickly, like works for, you know, the energy that you want the scene to, to do. Sometimes just, you know, just staying with one picture and not moving it at all works for what you're trying to say. So it really kind of depends on what's your intention. Um, I there's do, a, I there's don't a like this. I don't like this that are from one Carla picture to the next. We couldn't oh, hear of that. I think we look. Oh, oh, I don't like. I don't use dissolves very much. Like I don't unless it's 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 a long dissolve that has a lot of intention. I don't I don't play with dissolves that much. 
from picture to picture. With, with the what? Dissolves. You don't play with paint. Oh, dissolves. dissolves, yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. There's a question about working with a lot of archival footage and um, how do you um, choose what's important? I think we've talked about that, but anything else you want to say about that? Um, in the story or the type of archival that I use? I guess the story. Uh, story. Yeah. Um, it, it's really like understanding what's the goal, like what, you know, um, here, let me put it like, like this. Like I'm, I'm, I like, I'm a mapper. So after I watch the footage, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see what is the narrative arc of a character. Um, and, you know, again, like this kind of like big picture goal, like RBG was like how she became this fighter for women's rights. So even, you know, all the personal stuff kind of leads to that as well. Um, so once you kind of have an idea of that narrative arc, um, I just like to follow it. And, you know, it can change and that's okay, you know, but I, it just kind of gives me in, the intention and, and, and this goal to, and then, and then it allows me to make decisions, like just, you know, just go for decisions of like, okay, this scene is gonna only gonna be about this, even though it's a beautiful scene about so many other things, but right. let's just make it about one thing, right? Or this segment, you know, it needs to start here and it, need, it needs to lead us. Like there has to be a build up to a, that this big climax. So, so with that kind of thing in mind, you know, with like an outline of a structure, then then is that helps you make decisions as to what to let go of it changes throughout the process you know sometimes things come back in if it makes sense for the story and sometimes other things you know come out so your advice is be clear about the story arc and that will help you swim through all the material that you've collected yeah um I think we have time for one more clip. Which one would you like to show? Bush and Gore or the- um, Sure, I mean, that's a good example of the structure and that was a big challenge. The second one is something fun. If you guys want to talk about rhythm and, you know. Um, uh, it's up to you, Carla. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Should we just do something fun? Let's do something fun. We've been talking about structure too much. So let's do the last one. Okay, uh, Barbara, could you play the number four, please? We were all so hungry to hear from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Every time Justice Ginsburg wrote a dissent, the internet would explode. Justice Ginsburg has filed a dissenting opinion. Justice Ginsburg has filed a dissenting opinion. My dissenting opinion. I dissent. Dissent from today's decision. You just had to put the words Ruth Bader Ginsburg into something, and then it would get shared compulsively. become such a rock star and she enjoys it to see people wear notorious rbg t-shirts or other sort of paraphernalia with her face on it it's it's weird honestly she gives her rbg t-shirts to people she called and left did you get the birthday gift i said i did i'm wearing it <laughs> tattoos lots of tattoos yeah i had a picture of one of the tattoos i showed it to her and she goes, ugh, why would you do something so permanent? Here now to comment is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> All right, Justice coming in hot. Look, I'm ready to rumble, Mayweather Pacquiao style. I float like a butterfly, I sting like a bee, I clean myself like a fly. <laughs> It's so unlike mom, yeah, but I don't think mom, uh, or, uh, an accurate Im imitation of mom would be that funny. <laughs> you think she watches them? I don't think she ever has watched television. Yeah, I'm not sure she knows how to turn on. Oh, no, she watches the news hour while she's working out. Yeah, but to, that's at the court. Yeah. Right? Does she know how to turn on the television at home? I don't think so. Here to explain is Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> is this Saturday Night Live? <laughs> I like my men like I like my decisions. Five, four. <gasps> That's a third degree Ginsburg.
It's marvelously funny, I think. Remind you of yourself? Not one bit. <laughs> Except for the collar. <laughs> we were having a little trouble with the video for some people. So, um, uh, okay, Carla. So tell us about that editing. Did you get any help with the effects or did you do them all? Yeah, no, no, no. I don't, I don't do graphics. Uh, actually, um, my amazing associate editor, who we just we were just working together again um, in the last film we did, um, she she does a lot of great graphics. So we try like for, you know, for tempo, we try things with her, but then we use um, a great company that did all our graphics and, and special effects. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just so much fun. Like I had so much fun cutting that segment and I don't think it was, it, it wasn't a hard segment to cut. Like there was no chat, you know, it's like finding the right rhythm. But I remember getting the uh, the of her watching her Saturday Night Live <laughs> impersonation, and we just kept playing it like whole day. Like you know, we would take a break from editing and like we would watch her laugh at <laughs> and you know at the sketch. It was just so great, and that you know that kind of what we the energy that the mood that we wanted to inject to this segment. Um, so. Yeah, that's just like fun cutting. Like that's you know, rhythm. It's all about rhythm and you know, speed and tempo. So it was really and, fun. And it's nice in terms of the story structure to have this relief after the heaviness yeah. of all the legal issues. To like, okay, let's play. Let's play. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, I mean, I'm sure that our first pass was much longer. So it was. It probably hurt a little bit to cut some things, and I, probably Julie and Betsy were like, "No, we just we need to make it shorter." <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it feels it feels right. Um, so I I could even trim some things, like watching it now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> always, always. So we have some questions coming in, Carla. So let me um, uh, ask you some of them. Sure. Um, uh, did did um, Julie and Betsy shoot while you were editing, or was everything done when you started? No, um, actually, the interview with RD happened like, kind of late. Um, I don't remember if it was in the middle of edit or towards like the last third of our edit. Um, so we um, just edited the film as if the interview was never going to happen because you know. They, they weren't sure that they were going to, you know, get access. There was, there was a commitment and it was a pretty short interview. That's why, you know, she doesn't talk extensively about Marty. Uh -huh. um, or So it was very, it was like a very targeted interview because we really had a version of the film without it. Um, she's just, you know, she was a very, very busy woman. Uh, so, yes, they, kept, oh. they, they were shooting some things, like the gym, you know, the gym staff, which is in our opening, like her working out was in shot um, before I started. Um, you know, the stuff that was uh, harder to get access to or more delicate to get access to wasn't there. But um, the bulk of the interviews had been shot. Did that drive the team crazy to not know if you were going to have an interview with her and all that really sweet footage of her watching some of the archival footage and everything? I think that um, I love to see Julie and Betsy uh, work because they're just like, you know, they don't they don't question the, if not, if this is not gonna happen. Like we just went forward, we we were had, and they were already like, you know, um, gaining gaining more access and more trust with, with RBG. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was the, you know, it, it was probably like if, you know, if something, major happened at uh, the Supreme Court when the interview was scheduled or, you know. Um, so, I, they didn't tell me, which I appreciate, um, so yeah. Um, okay, so did anything unexpected or surprising happen during the edit? And did you learn something about editing from working on this film? That's a nice oh. 
Sure, I think about yeah. I learn I learn about editing for every film, um, but the unexpected thing that happened was the elections, and um, it was uh, I think it was it changed the mood a little bit <laughs> during our edit. Um, you know, um, most of us in the team were you know thinking that Hillary was going to win, and it was really strange like listening to the interviews because all the interviews. You know, there was this kind of feeling that, you know, she maybe could be replaced by a female president. So so it's kind of strange to continue working with those interviews when the reality had changed quite a bit. Um, so that was the unexpected thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I watch a lot of other documentaries when I'm working on something and I tend to watch documentaries that um, could, you know, help me think through problems, um, you know, documentaries that maybe are you know, hard to face these challenges or you know, have the same type of material. And I just really like to see how other people have tackled issues or, you know, how they handle narration in a way. So I'm always learning from other films. I'm always learning from other editors. And, you know, I definitely have a signature, like, in, you know, I mean, I can tell when I'm watching a specific editor sometimes without looking at the credits. Uh, and I'm sure that I, you know, I bring a bit of a signature to the projects that I work on. But yeah, I mean, how every- would you, how, how would you describe your style then? Um, I think that I, um, when I work with archival, I, a lot of what I built are, you know, I make, um, kind of varied the scenes out of archival. Like for example, her, you know, walking into the Supreme Court into the Supreme Court that first time, it's, you know, it's not using archival as a, just illustration of what you're hearing from the interview, but kind of like, you know, building a scene around a moment. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's how I tackle archival a lot. Um, so there's some similarities in the archival um, films that I, I edit. Um, and, you know, same with like Verite. There is kind of like maybe a rhythm. Like, for example, you know, um, I've learned a lot from Kate Amend in the way that she mixes. Um, she, you know, she's an amazing editor from LA. The way that she mixes like interview voiceover with, with observational footage. Um, you know, it just like, it flows so beautifully. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I would say David Teak has a signature, um, um, Nails, I'm totally gonna forget his last name, but there's an amazing editor out of San Francisco who does this like, you know, it just kind of pushes the craft um, into some really interesting, you know, directions that I, I don't think I could, you know, push the material that way. Um, he did uh, let the fire burn, let, let the fire burn. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. The late, the hottest August. He did camera person. Oh, so right. he's just like, you know, and you can tell when I see a film of his and I learned so much from, from that. So yes, I think we all have a bit of a signature, you know, you can tell our heads. Yeah. And what was the big problem that you faced in editing this that you had to contend with? I think it was um, the two biggest challenges were, or maybe three, um, the fact that we, it was made out of tiny little pieces and we, we had to make sure that it didn't feel like a montage for 90 minutes, that it really like, and that's, you know, we're building actual scenes from archival, yeah. like really helped us. Um, the second was the legal language, which I talked about, like how not to make that confusing yeah. or, you know, boring. And the third one was like once we accomplished in the film in telling her story uh, and the combination of her fight for women's rights, um, what happens after? And that was that was um, you know kind of hard to put together. Instead of like the film feeling like okay, once she became a justice, she did this, 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 and a list of events or a list of accomplishments. Uh -huh. We needed to also you know find a way. Her voice change, and that was uh, that was quite difficult. Um, and you know, I hope we manage that. But um, yeah. but that the, the, our third act, I found I found myself it was the most difficult part of the film to edit, structurally. Right, 
Right, right. And what about music? Um, did you bring the music in right away or did you? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah? Yeah, I work, I like working with 10 music that like will, you know, hopefully capture some of the sense of what the music is going to be later on, even if it changes quite a bit, um, at least the tempo or a bit of the mood. Um, but with this one, um, you know, Julie and Bessie really wanted to capture her taste in music and also what represents her. I mean, with, you know, the comparisons with like oh. Notorious, you know, as the Notorious RBG, right. Right. you think hip hop and like pop culture. Um, and we had conversations about like, is this movie, you know, is this film like sounding a little bit schizophrenic because we had um, her love for classical music very present in the film with like opera and like some big classical uh, cues. And we had our soundtrack from a fantastic composer. And then we had like the hip hop stuff. Um, so we're like, I hope like people are not feeling like, you know, <laughs> we're going all over the place. I think we found a good balance. I, I haven't heard too many critiques about that. So <laughs> hopefully people don't feel like, you know, crazy right. when they watch it. So someone wants, uh, would like to know what advice you have for someone who wants to be an editor. Um, um, well, um, I would say, um, you know, try to find people to work with who can become your mentors, um, that, you know, that's, you can learn the craft from people that have been doing it for a while, because it's not, it's not as easy as it looks like once you watch the finished film. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's a long process and, and we all go through the same, you know, kind of growing pains of making a film. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, and then just watch a lot of stuff, like learn from other, from other, you know, how other editors handle things. And if you can listen to them talk about if, you know, they break down a scene in a panel, like try to go to all the stuff because you, you start learning about the thinking behind the decisions that they made that took them to this like really flowy, you know, pretty easy, like, you know, a scene that looks so easy that it always had to be like that, but it took a lot of work. So that's what I would say. If you, if you wanna go to film school, there's some really great film schools out there now. So many more than when I went to film school. <laughs> and um, did you ever get to meet RBG? Yes, I met her um, at the premiere. And um, yeah, she had not seen the film when we shot it at Sundance. Uh, it was a very large auditorium and our entire production team was not looking at the film. We were just looking at her <laughs> and her reaction to the film. And uh, we saw her, we saw her like get teary eyed, especially with the Marty segments. And she laughed out loud, you know, during the funny moments. So we felt like if we had succeeded in like taking her through an emotional ride about her own life, like if we had a good film in our hands and hopefully other people would enjoy it. Um, but you know, with editors, it's really strange. Like you meet people that you spend so much time with, you've like even memorized the way that they breathe and the way that they speak and they have no idea who you are. And with RBG, she had no idea what editors do. <laughs> so, so I have learned throughout the years to just kind of stay back, like, and not bother the characters that I've been editing for a long time because it's strange for them as much as it's kind of strange for me. So, that's great. That's great. Any final thoughts? We have one minute left. Ah. Oh. No, I guess, you know, I, I, I love edit. Oh, what's next? Um, so um, expect another film from Julie and Betsy. Um, we've been working on a film about Julia Child that I can actually say out loud because they've announced it in the press. Another biography. Um, yeah, another biography, another amazing woman. Um, and it is so much fun. Like I was, I was watching the cut the other and I had a smile on my face and I think we all kind of need some of her energy and like, yeah, her love for food. And so I'm really excited for people to, to watch that and just enjoy the moment. Well, Carla, so, uh, we can't thank you enough for 
um, uh, uh, talking to us about your craft and your artistry and uh, immortalizing RBG for, for all of us. So thank you for New York Women in Film and TV. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I hope I made sense. I always, editors yes. are not used to talking about her work so much. Mm.